here tonight James R. Mahoney, who is Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and Director of the Climate Change Science Program, which means in short that he's now um, in charge of the nation's climate research. And his talk is the future of global climate ch change research, key issues emerging from the December 3 to 5, that was last week in Washington DC workshop. Let me say a few words about Jim since he was a classmate of mine at MIT. Uh, his professor was Reggie Newell and mine was Victor Starr, who both worked very closely together, so it was almost the same as being in the same research project. Um, but after he left MIT, uh, I sort of lost track of him, but he's had a very uh, prestigious career in, in public service and um, science uh, environmental management. And I guess this got started because after he got his PhD, he took a professorship, but it was on the faculty of public health at Harvard, rather, in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences, which was, okay, both Jim and I had degrees in meteorology. You don't get degrees in meteorology anymore. A few years after that, everybody decided atmospheric science sounded more interdisciplinary, and, and now I'm not sure there are too many atmospheric science degrees anymore either. Uh, so, Jim, uh, after being at Harvard for a couple of years, uh, drew on this experience and co-founded environmental management company, uh, ERT, Environmental Research and Technology, which grew to be the largest environmental um, firm uh, in the country. And I'm not going to go through, he's done very many other things since then. I'm just going to point out his previous activity similar to his present one. He was director of the uh, National Acid Precipitation Assessment Program, NAPAP, um, starting in 1988, and that was almost as complicated an issue as the climate change issue. Um, so without any more ado, let me let Jim get started. Okay, now I can't be taken away from it. <laughs> Thank you, Bob, very much. Uh, we uh, aging breed of the last meteorologists. I, uh, I had forgotten that implication, and it's good to keep, keep track of. Uh, we've got a lot to cover, and I want to make sure to leave a fair amount of the time for questions. And I can make this easy. I, I've talked so much today that with a little cold, I'm going hoarse. So I think I'm going to give the first four minutes and then get one of my colleagues to give the rest of this so they can all be preparing out in the audience there. Uh, the, uh, a couple of points of uh, reflection uh, as a starting point. Uh, Bob did mention that I went over to the Faculty of Public Health at Harvard after my time at MIT. And uh, I did end up spending eight years there. Uh, we, we began the firm that Bob also mentioned pretty quickly after at that time. But there's something there I'm glad to note for the purpose of the things that we're dealing with uh, here now and the things that have touched my career. I learned a tremendous amount by osmosis being in a public health faculty. Uh, and by the way, one of the things you learned at a university like Harvard is that the public health endowment is very little because people who go into public health take government jobs and serve the public. People who go into medicine and law and business go out and earn the big dollars and endow major university centers, of course. But at the core of it, the, the uh, public service and public protection mission of public health is something that really uh, serves, has served me and continues to serve me, I hope, in good stead in all the years of uh, working in meteorology and uh, related fields uh, ever since that time. So I commend that and I commend it for the interdisciplinary aspect that that represents as well. And then one other note reflecting back and I'll get on to our topic here. I was thinking a little while ago today, my very first uh, uh, scientific paper presentation was while Bob and I were students together at MIT, 40 years ago this year at the AGU winter meeting, which happened to be at Stanford in that case, uh, I gave a, a paper on a theoretical analysis of 
the atmosphere of Venus as a uh, dense, reflective, slowly rotating uh, atmosphere, uh, spherical shell atmosphere under a, a hot sun. And uh, in those days, the big AGU meeting was in wa was the Washington one in April, and this was the Western one was the small one. But so I made the great trek out west from the East Coast at the time to do that. So for me, it's a special pleasure to be back 40 years later, uh, addressing uh, a different issue of uh, some note. Now, with all of that, let me move on to the main part of the uh, topic here. And uh, uh, as I say, I both have much I'd like to cover for you, at least in overview, and then I want to definitely save time for questions, which I could imagine could be anything from science questions to public policy questions to, to uh, uh, budget and resource questions. So there's much, many dimensions some of these issues might, might run. Uh, let me, uh, I'll ask my friend and colleague Jamie here to uh, just move ahead on these uh, now. Uh, we now call the Federal Climate Science Program by the name you see at the top of this slide. That is the U.S. Climate Change Science Program. And by itself, it is a combination of the U.S. GCRP that most of you would be familiar with, the old Global Change Research uh, Program, uh, and, the, uh, and President Bush's initiative in the form of the Climate Change Research Initiative. I don't really want to spend long on this bureaucratic uh, view, but it's important to fix ideas for just a minute before we move along. Uh, the the uh, GCRP program began by the seminal work and leadership of three individuals uh, whom many of you would know, uh, Bob Carell, who was at NSF, uh, Shelby Tilford, who was at NASA, and Mike Hall, who was at NOAA at that time. And they took leadership in getting this new work in global change started in 1987. By 1990, Congress codified this in the form of the Global Change Research Act of 1990, and this program has carried on since that time. Uh, one point of note, especially for this audience, uh, there, the expenditures since 1990 and under GCRP now total $20 billion. Uh, so uh, the, the fact is much has gone into this area and of course it has supported uh, programs in many different uh, arenas and areas as I'll try to describe a little bit more. The, uh, the point of this slide is to call attention to the fact that when the President began taking some initiatives a few months after coming into office, uh, in this area, the first thing he did was aim toward uh, challenging the science community to build on the long-standing record of work under GCRP of exploratory science, basic research, many field ex expedition studies, lots of monitoring work, and start taking that work and saying, how can we take some of that community and direct the efforts of some of the people in that community toward answering a more specific series of questions, the kinds of questions we need to address so that we can understand what the possible outcomes of uh, various types of action, no action, different types of control action, and all the rest relative to global change. We need to get that information in front of us we want to leave the basic research and monitoring communities doing their jobs, but we need to have a more focused approach, as actually a number of other nations have done, to more discreetly ask questions of that community, of the science community and the monitoring community, so we can have a better idea as to where we're headed. So the president took a couple of steps, as indicated here, first by announcing that and then setting up a broader management structure. The next slide now. You won't be able to read the detail. That's good. This is for Washington. Uh, but this, the sense of this is that the president took a, a strong step by saying that these programs in science and technology, and I'm assuming this will work, the green box here is the science program. The other green box is the technology program. The science program for which I'm responsible has 13 agencies cooperating. So basically everybody you think of in this area, from NASA to NSF to NOAA to DOE, they're all on there if you read the detail, and many of you are quite familiar with this. <coughs> Excuse me. Nearly all the same agencies, 
are in the technology program as well. And what the president did was to say, let's put these activities that in total are budgeted at more than $3 billion a year of uh, ongoing work on a continuous basis, let's get these focused and brought to the attention of the White House through the cabinet departments. So first thing he did was to create a cabinet level committee chaired by two cabinet secretaries, my boss Don Evans, who's Secretary of Commerce, where NOAA has been for the last century, uh, and Spencer Abraham is Secretary of Energy. And in another stroke of good government, cabinet secretaries are too busy to get anything done. Uh, uh, so the real management of the program is in the hands of the deputy secretaries, uh, the number two, and the deputy secretaries and the deputy administrators, for example, for EPA uh, and the like, uh, are very frequently of the nature of the chief operating officers for these entities. And this supervisory group of the number two people in virtually all the federal cabinet departments uh, uh, and independent agencies has been meeting nearly once a month over much of this year working on this program. So while you don't read about it in the paper all the time, there in fact is a whole lot of activity that has been going on and that's the sense of message I wanted to convey that this is not business as usual but we are at a time of change in these fields and there's a lot of attention, I hope and I think very constructive attention being paid here. With that let me uh, move on now. Uh, the, uh, in, in moving forward I, I wanted to put in just one slide to remind we have looked to the National Academy, and of course your president and our moderator tonight, Bob, uh, represents uh, by his membership uh, the importance of the Academy. But the Academy has had a number of panels directly addressing uh, global climate issues in the very recent past, as well as some very old studies as, uh, too. But uh, I simply note these here, I don't, with time limitations, I don't want to go into them in detail here. I will point out that the last of these four, uh, climate change, science, and analysis of some key questions, uh, was the product of the committee chaired by Ralph Cicerone, whom many of you know. Uh, and that committee took its assignment directly by this administration, who asked the Academy <coughs> to form a committee, which Ralph then chaired, to look at the IPCC third assessment and comment on it and also to look, on all, look at all the relevant questions and give advice back to the nation and to our government about uh, priorities and how to proceed in addressing key uh, open questions in the science area. Uh, in, uh, in following the work which I'm going to talk about in the context of this workshop uh, in just a couple of minutes, I want to point out that uh, as part of the focus that the Academy provided and as part of what President Bush has called for, uh, we have tended to think of the work that we're doing uh, in the nature of new work in addition to the long, uh, go and long uh, continuing and ongoing GCRP studies in, in three broad categories. One of them is clearly continuing important uh, science discovery areas. <clears throat> and just to make that a little bit more real, obviously Asian brown cloud and other carbon-based aerosol uh, studies are part of this. Uh, um, uh, climate model sensitivity, and climate model intercomparisons are part of this. Generally, cloud feedback uh, continuing work is a key part of this activity and many others. Second, uh, we have had a growing concept that we really need worldwide a, a much higher level of statement of requirements system. So when we use this uh, observation and data concept, we're thinking of obviously the atmosphere uh, and the oceans, including the deep ocean, thinking of the issues of vertical transport through the mixing layer for heat, for chemicals and so forth, clearly the cryosphere, and then even more so ecosystems. We're at the infant stage of monitoring and understanding the interactions between ecosystems of great diversity and climate parameters. So uh, when we think in this sense, I just want to recommend for your view the concept that 
uh, we need to be thinking of climate variability in a way that extends all the way across and is inclusive of ecosystem responses and ecosystem forcing on climate change. Uh, next and third in this list is really a major theme, and I'm going to come to these theme statements more in just a minute. That is, it's what I said a couple of minutes ago about the president's direction is to say, let's go to the science and make sure that we're really developing what, in some fancy words we've tried to say here, are decision support resources. For a while we were calling this decision support tools, but we started getting the feedback that tools sounded like that there might be one master climate model or something else that it, once we got it together, we would just run cases and that was, some, that was a tool in the toolkit. So it seemed to be better to broaden the concept about what, was our, what were our decision support resources. But the concept is to say that, to put another way, it's in the sense of transition from some of the fundamental and basic science toward application in the sense of projecting future outcomes and looking at various scenarios so that our great body of scientific information can be directed so toward some of the key national and global questions in this area. Now, uh, I want to talk specifically about the workshop that we just held in Washington this last week that I'm sure some of you here attended, uh, others have heard about. Uh, and I wanted to put this in the context that we are now using the title the U.S. Climate Change Science Program to embrace both of those other bureaucratic titles, the long-running GCRP as well as the President's Climate Initiative. But what we've done in the last uh, seven or eight months is to say to get the issues out we wanted to take a major step at structuring our questions, structuring the information we know, structuring our information needs, and most importantly interacting with the entire scientific community, U.S. and international scientific community, and the various stakeholder communities uh, while we find our way toward trying to address the questions that we think are most important. When I talk about stakeholder communities, just to be clear, by the way, we think of clearly environmental groups and other NGOs are stakeholders who have an interest in, in seeing protection. In many cases, business and economic interests are stakeholders with different interests, but we are looking for ways to make those parallel when possible. But remember, there's another major set of stakeholders who are the resource managers in regions in many cases. They're urban planners, transportation system planners, utility system planners, forest managers, water resource system managers, you name it. We could easily put a dozen or three dozen examples down right away. We have much more data and many more analysis methods to help us better manage the stressed life support systems that, that uh, support and sustain our urban and non-urban life in America and by extension around the world. So those are all stakeholders of this as well. Now working within that, uh, we took the view that we would put together a strategic plan to re-ask the questions and focus on where we think we could get, especially in the near term with, an, with a view toward the long term as well. We, uh, as planned in some earlier announcements, we published a, what we called a discussion draft strategic plan on the website that we use. And the website address which is on this is simply climatescience.gov, if you're not familiar with it otherwise. No space, just climatescience.gov. Uh, <clears throat> and we put that out in early November and uh, uh, in an exercise that we might well have taken 12 months, but we brushed the whole thing to do it in six months so we could get going on all of this. But uh, what we did was to seek very broad input <clears throat> of the plan by the community, and it is that community input that we had in this very vigorous workshop in Washington last week. Uh, in the sense of openness and full documentation of everything, the website is open to receive comments, both from those who attended the workshop and from anybody else who wants to look at the information and offer their comments up through January 13th. Then we'll be working on completing the strategic plan by April, and that's a very big undertaking to get that done and reviewed with everything that we're dealing with by that time. But we want to draw this planning phase to a close so that we can be moving along with more implementation and reporting of results uh, for use in our nation and around the world. That's the sense of ongoing here. 
Now, in setting out the strategic plan, uh, this is a little bit motherhood, but we really worked on these matters, so uh, the federal program should be held up to these measures, and you should be aware of them. First, we took this question-based strategic plan. The concept was to facilitate communication by putting things in the form of questions uh, and also to uh, try to achieve a certain integration. Uh, asking questions about what's relevant and what we should do about it tends to help avoid the problem of, of simply going down greater levels of detail in, in particular science areas where the issue here is using the science to help, give, help guide national decisions. Second, we integrate the two programs as I've discussed. Uh, third, we're after both the scientific and stakeholder communities. Fourth and important, we want the studies to be done to be what is called here policy relevant. That is, we want to rather comprehensively address possible future outcomes that the nation and the world should be interested in. But at the same time, we want our analysis as the government analysis and a fact-finding mode to be policy neutral. In other words, what we're trying to do with studies, analysis, and especially projections is to ask questions that are of the nature of if then. If we don't do anything different, what kinds of outcomes in terms of Earth system impact do we expect? If we do one type of control scenario, what do we expect? If we do other types, what do we expect? And so forth. And then we've gone to great lengths to try to make sure that we have a very transparent and open process that is comprehensive and that is also uh, uh, comparable. For example, we want to make as much as we can comparability with IPCC cases. We can't adopt that completely, but we want to do as much of that as we can. And we want to be very clear when we're trying to lay out information for public debate that we deal with basis and certainty analysis or uncertainty analysis in the findings. Uh, working with this, and after all this time into my talk here now, I want to state something uh, here, and, uh, and I'll ask you to focus on this for a minute. Uh, we stated two themes for the workshop, and these are themes of this administration, and sometimes there's a misunderstanding about this. So I want to make sure we're very clear. We stated them here. I stated these themes in congressional testimony that I presented in both houses of Congress this last summer. And understand when I presented that testimony, it was reviewed by all of the agencies, it was reviewed by all the White House entities, uh, so it really stands for something. First, uh, we view global climate change to be a real capstone issue for our generation. No one is trying to minimize this issue. No one is trying to say it's so uncertain that we never need to do anything. There's a, de uh, there's a need definitely to be prudent in the uh, deployment of resources short and long term about what we do, but it's clearly understood that there's an issue that we really have to deal with. Notice the second sentence in that theme. Uh, we, uh, if our thoughts about the importance of anthropogenic forcing bear out, and I mean the importance relative to natural variability, no one is disputing that there are significant anthropogenic forcing elements, but if it's as severe as it may be, we have a need in our country, but really in the world, to move to a whole new suite of technologies in time. We will not get to pick any parameters, CO2 stabilization or anything else, by uh, having a gradual increase in uh, fuel efficiency in motor vehicles alone, for example, unless we'd like to make the gradual increase from uh, 20, the low 20 miles per gallon to 60 miles per gallon. And if we're going to get there, uh, then we better understand what we're doing and the cost and whether there are other things that we're better to do. So we're looking at the issue of not simply doing uh, some steps, but being open to a very vigorous development of different technologies uh, and deploying them because that's what we may need. And that's a major driver for the science now uh, that really goes to the kind of question of what exactly should we do? It's not just the detection question, but it's the question of what can we say, what can we project, and where do we need to be? The second theme uh, goes to what I've been speaking about here, which is the matter of moving from the underlying research and monitoring to uh, applications uh, or the development of essential information to, look, to examine response strategies. 
Uh, I keep in mind a little bit of a chemical engineering analogy here in the sense of a slipstream approach. We don't want to stop the process of basic research and monitoring, but we do want to tap into that process and make sure that some of the best, best and brightest who are doing the underlying analysis apply part or all of their time for some period to helping address the questions, as I put it a few minutes ago, that are like if-then questions. But to get where we ought to get, we really need to be putting more energy and emphasis into addressing those issues so that we can lay out a kind of a robust record for national debate and international debate about what we think, especially tying it into that uh, key new technology uh, uh, approach. Now, just a, a couple of details to give you an idea of what went on with this workshop last week. When we started the uh, planning for this, we thought we might attract three or four hundred people. We were delighted and humbled that we had 1,500 people come to the workshop. And just by sheer registration data, they came from 47 of the 50 states and from 35 other nations. And this was a session where while we had 225 people involved as presenters, panelists, rapporteurs, moderators, and so forth, one summary statement I was making is that there were a couple of hundred people around who would typically be at a meeting like that only if they were a key speaker who weren't even speaking. But such a big part of the community, and again, the science and stakeholder community came, we had, and uh, I believe I'm in a sense the worst reporter, so ask your colleagues who were there, but we had a very open and a very robust discussion that I think many of us feel really moved the marker about saying, let's stay out of the politics here and let's just really address what we know and how we can advance that, excuse me, and how we can tie that into the technology issues we need to address. So uh, I'll just mention before going on, too, that uh, to try to tie the political process to this, we had uh, virtually all of the senior U.S. government science policy leaders uh, as keynote speakers as well. Uh, uh, and along with our 24 breakout sessions, we brought everything back for reporting and plenary. It was a, a great richness that uh, was frustrating for everybody because there wasn't time to do all we might have liked, but it really seemed to be a step forward. But to give an idea of the high-level government representatives, Bruce Alberts, the president of the Academy, uh, spoke. Rita Caldwell and his, her role as, na as director of the National Science Foundation. Uh, Sean O'Keefe, the NASA Administrator, my boss, Conrad Lautenbacher, whom many of you know, the NOAA Administrator, Spencer Abraham, the Secretary of Energy, Governor Christine Todd Whitman, the EPA Administrator, uh, Sam Bodman, the Deputy Secretary of Commerce for our boss, Secretary Evans, who was in South America, and representing the international community, uh, Dr. Pachuri, who is the new chairman of IPCC, which is supervised by WMO and, uh, and UNEP, and uh, uh, Patrick Obazi, Secretary General of, of WMO, spoke, and uh, Klaus Topfer, the Executive Director of UNEP and Deputy, uh, uh, and Deputy Secretary General of the UN, was to speak but had to cancel because of a problem in his schedule at almost the last minute. So one thing we did last week was to make sure that the major policy community stood up and spoke up about the importance of these issues in this workshop. And the rest of the workshop was addressed toward individual issues and, and uh, technical analysis then. I'm going to very quickly, I don't want to take our time, in fact, I want to get on to questions very quickly, but uh, let me just put up titles and you can quickly scan. Uh, you'll see a lot of same old uh, familiar topics. The fourth of these as we come to them, and Jamie, why don't you start going ahead. Uh, uh, we're largely cross-cutting issues, but you'll see everything in there, but, oh, sorry, Jamie, if you can go back one on that, now that I say go ahead, uh, there are just a couple of things I want to call attention to. A couple of specific sessions on scenario development and really looking at where we are with climate models and our ability to do uh, future things. Very robust session on international uh, 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 collaboration, and now let's go ahead to the next one because I want to pick up... Uh, 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 among other things, uh, uh, a very interesting and fascinating session on, on some of this uh, new generation technology 
and a, uh, a very uh, well attended session on uh, the debates about tropospheric temperature measurements looking at both surface OBS and MSU or microwave sounder unit satellite observations where virtually all of the principal contenders in that area instead of just uh, uh, being quoted uh, in the abstract created a white paper and debated it and we had a very uh, useful discussion. It's all in the record. Uh, we'll be continuing to deal with this going forward. And then uh, in the last of this set the final set of the specialty sessions were largely interactive in their approach. Uh, I might mention in the applied climate model session, some of you may know Tetsuya Sato. Dr. Sato is the director general of the Japanese Earth Simulator, and uh, which is, uh, for the moment, by quite a large margin, the largest and fastest computing system in the world. And uh, uh, in a session chaired by Rick Anthes, uh, we, uh, we asked uh, Dr. Sato to give some illustrations of what can be done at a 10 kilometer and uh, 70 layer vertical, 10 kilometer horizontal, 70 layer vertical mesh climate model. Very fascinating results. And among other things, showing the natural model generation of the Kuroshio current, showing cyclogenesis on a small scale, and just uh, displaying the richness that can be in the Navier-Stokes equations if we can uh, suppress computational error and really deal with processes at that level. Next. Uh, just a quick word before concluding. Results, uh, uh, what to say in a single slide. Many, many useful suggestions. Uh, overall, I think a very enthusiastic attitude about addressing this sort of uh, refreshed suite of science questions. Uh, very strong support about this idea that we have to get along about technology development. One thing I really key about that, uh, Bob Sokolow, who some of you may know, who's a, a professor at Princeton, uh, reported the result of a technology panel and had a very uh, interesting uh, point reminding that the uncertainty in technologies and their deployment and their cost and their unintended consequences are even greater than our uncertainties in the science. And if we're, if we're talking about solutions, we need to join those systems so that we uh, mutually seek uh, efficiency in both at the same time. Uh, uh, appreciation for the new focus on getting uh, information that can hopefully guide public debate in the future. And let's go ahead. Clearly more work needs to be done. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to mention before concluding too that uh, Bruce Albers had uh, worked with us to uh, have the Academy take on a special review function. So we not only have taken this open approach with everything on the website, but also the uh, Academy or the NRC has formed a new 17-member uh, uh, committee uh, and, uh, chaired by Tom Graydell at Yale. Uh, and the committee uh, had a first meeting before the workshop. Committee members have participated in the meeting this last week, except uh, seeing Bob Weller here. <laughs> uh, no, near, nearly everybody was at the uh, uh, committee was at the meeting. Uh, the uh, Academy's committee uh, will re, uh, has already had the chance to see the workshop. They will review the written comments, and they're going to do two reports for us. One report by February, which is warp speed because of the Academy review processes, but they've agreed to do something very quickly to give us the input of their best thoughts at that time to help inform what we'll put in the final version of this plan. As I said before, we want to get out of planning mode and into implementation mode. And then the Academy Committee will stay in existence and in approximately next September will review our final plan and they will also review the process we've put together in this case of using this very open public review approach as a way to seek the best uh, possible approach to this. Now the kinds of issues, and I, uh, I'll let you read for a minute, they're sort of obvious. And one of them that comes to research funding is resources and prioritization. A simple thing to say, obviously, the things we lay out would easily call for much more resource. Uh, when we're spending $1.7 billion in the research already, even though I recognize how much that's all programmed, uh, we can't expect to see something like a doubling or anything else of that. We're in a deficit economy, times are tough. And uh, as I said at the close of the workshop, too, to the participants there, we will have to take seriously the issue of prioritization to get where we need to be. 
many linkages between topics, great focus on the regional climate questions, and I commend that for your interest. There's much that we need to address on the regional basis. This is by no means all just a global issue. I don't intend to go through all those, obviously ecosystem modeling and all the rest. Uh, and let's go on to the last uh, of these uh, uh, view graphs then. Uh, a path forward, we just said a few things about this. We'll get the revised plan out in April. We even have a kind of an optional approach that if we're, uh, there may well be some issues that are so sticklers, so much sticklers we can't get them done by April. We'll take the view, we'll do a 95% complete plan and take a reserve on anything that we need a little more time rather than hold the process up. Because what we're trying to do in the administration is move the whole thing, get information in front of the public, be in a better position to develop national approaches and plans. Uh, the plan will, among many uh, things, but these were specific feedbacks that came in the workshop, we need to deal with adaptation as well as mitigation for, for climate, effect, climate change effects. We didn't say enough of that. We clearly need to deal with the decision support, the regional questions, the ecosystem. Technology will be in it. Uh, we've got to do much more cross-cutting. And there's a sense that uh, the science community and the stakeholder communities have to really work proactively at getting the information out to even broader sets. This is a key issue for our nation, and it's not good enough to simply say we're doing the science. That's where we're at. And we saved as a special category what I mentioned a minute ago. We know there will be resource limitation issues here. I don't expect to see anything like wholesale dismantling of anything, but I think all 13 agencies who are collaborating in this uh, are ready that uh, for the next federal budget process, now that we've had the workshop and the feedback and we'll have the remainder of the written feedback by January 13th, we're going to have to sit down and say, what does this mean by way of priorities? And we're going to have to be open probably to more creative thinking about where to go with research in this area for this next budget cycle than we have any time in recent years anyway, because the time is upon us to be open to say, how can we responsibly best address these questions? Let me stop there to save some time for your questions too. Thanks for your attention through this part. Thank you. Where are you still? No, I'll stand in. Okay. Uh, yeah, why don't you make your way I, toward the mics? I see the one up, I see two up front, and there is, are there some toward the back of the room, or are they all up front? Okay, so you really have to be in front of your colleagues. <laughs> Um, I thought it was a pretty exciting presentation. I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about this. It's a real concern. One of the things, though, that I saw missing in your plan that concerns me a lot is the continued scientific input into the process. What often happens in bureaucratic systems where the uh, system comes together and makes a decision and then go off and implement is the, st the stopping of the scientific input process. And the National Academy has actually written a number of reports on this, including one on the impact on weather prediction, where the, once the system was implemented in the 50s on weather prediction, they stopped doing new science uh, and inputting that into the system. So I, one of the things I think you really need to keep on your plan process is that open channel to the scientific community and the, the perception that the scientific research is not finished. Well, thank you. That's a very good comment, and it's a good one to start with. Uh, like anything, uh, my speaking about this is a great opportunity for me to hear and learn that, uh, too. It's like all of us have seen when we, whether we teach a class or give a seminar or give a paper, uh, you always learn more by doing it than anybody learns by listening, I think, at the end of the day. So I take that feedback seriously, and I would urge uh, you and others to uh, look at giving us that comment in writing on the website. The reason I stress that is I, I go back to what's in this process. I worry about the, there are so many people involved in this right now. There were probably 300 people who worked on the development of the plan and its review and all the rest of it. Uh, and there's so much going on. 
and that the written word is much better than uh, just the, the verbal statement. One of the great benefits of doing this on the website now is we can do that. And on that climatescience.gov website, there's a link directly to a comment form. And all we want in the forum is we're trying to make it a little bit easy to uh, segregate the topic area of the comments because we expect at least hundreds, if not a thousand or two. So we're trying to make it a little bit efficient about how we address it. But I agree that's a key point. Uh, clearly nobody expects to stop, but it would be a concern, uh, human nature and political nature being what they are. What the president did with naming an initiative of somewhat indefinite life, but the language that went with the president's climate change research initiative a year ago was that it was, it was a challenge to the scientific community to help in the short term. And then the short term at that time was defined as two to five years out to give some idea. So in the plan, since almost 18 months went from then, we wrote the plan around the metrics of where can we be in two years and where can we be in four years. By the way, we got to that by subtracting a year off, but agreeing in government we could never get anywhere in one year. So we didn't subtract it. We one off of both two and five. We subtracted one off the five. Uh, but the plan is therefore written with a look toward that. And, and don't overemphasize that. We understand the real world doesn't go by just scheduling exactly, but we were trying to use the discipline of, of addressing what are we doing and why and when and so forth. Uh, but the interesting part of the bus, the president's initiative, is that it operates with a, an understanding that the underlying exploratory research basically needs to go on forever. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, issues that can have trillions of dollars effect on our economy over the next generation and on other economies in the world. And we have to study these. We have to continue to be open to discovery. But in the very immediate term, if you and some others would say so on the website, that would be very useful feedback. We'll go left once more and then to the right here. This is left. Um, starting back around 95, if you looked in Our Changing Planet, or maybe it was 96, you'd find a new box called assessment, which at the time I thought was in effect, trying to, uh, to formally have a way to provide policy relevant uh, information to decision makers, because there was a recognition even back then that, that um, uh, the research program wouldn't necessarily provide uh, results that would be useful to a decision maker on a time frame that they work. Now, I guess my question is what's different now um, in what's happening than that box which tried to, in fact, provide this kind of information? And why is it that? If the research that had been done through uh, 1990 through 2001 and 2 wasn't able to provide policy relevant information that you could actually pre present to someone that definitively enough that they could say, uh, in terms of carbon reduction or something, some act, some bureauc some uh, decision that would be supported scientifically, wh why will why will this now provide that information and is it really a separate track? in addition to what was going on before, or, or are you really... Want okay, uh, again, a, a good question about uh, is this assessment, is it the same as the assessment activities initiated in recent years? I have some perspective about uh, assessment because I labored under the uh, direction of Dr. Knaus here in the... Uh, John, where'd you hide just now? Oh, you're right here. I, you moved again since I... When, when uh, John Knaus was NOAA administrator, he provided very important uh, uh, air cover for me during my time as director of the Federal Acid Rain Assessment Program. We had assessment as our middle name in that in the 1980s, in that program that was established by legislation. And for a series of political reasons, assessment wasn't done well in that case, as a matter of fact, and we lost a lot of value that might have come out of that work. In recent years, I would say uh, two things. Uh, one, uh, in the sense of real openness, some of you know at least a little, and I'm sure many of you know a lot, there were some very great debates and challenges about the regional slash national assessment activities 
carried out in recent years, and unfortunately in some ways it set our field back that those debates uh, caused uh, 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 almost a, th a third rail, don't touch it kind of feeling about uh, some of the underlying science. That's a great disservice to our field. That came up in discussion at the workshop this last week, and somebody said in, in a comment from the floor then that uh, characterized the work under that national assessment as some was excellent work, some was mediocre work, some was bad work. And after the comment was finished, I said, I agree with that. I also believe some was excellent, some was mediocre, some was bad. Uh, and we are trying to move beyond uh, that now. Now to your specific question, uh, what's different, maybe this is very much the same kind of assessment, but we're embracing it now where we've gone out of our way to involve the whole range of stakeholders. We did everything we could to get the far right, the far left, the, the, the regional resource managers, uh, and the science community in its own right to say let's look at this and let's understand we're starting a process and we're going to try to make every step of it open and on the table so that we'll talk about, the, that's why those simple words on basis and characterization of certainty or uncertainty and the open process of de de describing the cases we'll calculate and what they mean, what inferences we can draw, I find the difference to be much more in that approach or process than on the choice of words, assessment or decision support. So I, I would argue that's the difference we're looking for. And it's, it's in the sense of building on what went before and, and uh, some things went off track unfortunately but let's learn from that and and uh, hopefully we can uh, move things a lot better a lot further the next time here okay. thank you uh, Jim as you pointed out in your opening statement that uh, this program began under the president's which is father uh, when they started that organized work in climate research. Um, it's, what you presented in this work, about this workshop is, is interesting, but it's kind of abstract. Would you care to uh, comment at all about what one might expect to see, say, 18 months from now in terms of changes in organization within the government that would more focus, put more focus or address this program? Uh, would you say anything at all about additional money? Would you care to say anything at all about uh, uh, additional new kinds of programs that might be in place that are not in place at present? Uh, that's an easy one, isn't it? Thanks, John. <laughs> so, uh, and I think the answer is yes, no, and maybe. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, really, you're, you're right on, of course, uh, uh, about that. And actually, even as you're asking the question, I'm thinking that uh, part of what I present is somewhat abstract because I'm trying to summarize a tremendously large activity. And, and I feel that I don't do justice to the uh, depth of the specialty sessions and what went on last week. I think nearly everybody there found that to be a very pleasing brass tax experience where nobody was a, sort of allowed just by the context. Nobody was allowed to go off and make extreme crazy statements but really had to try to focus on, on questions and we had a lot of very good discussion and development uh, and the uh, uh, the biggest frustration was there just wasn't time for questions and for as much discussion as we'd like. So in a way, uh, if I can ask you to do a little thought experiment among those in the room, understand my somewhat dry discussion of the whole thing was much more active and concrete about at least technical subject matter in the last week. But you're asking a different client, kind, you're looking for other kinds of specifics quite rightly too, which is about what will this mean about the programs. Uh, first statement, I wish I could say there'll be major new money. Uh, and that's an easy statement uh, to make. I, I go back to something that is uh, uh, sort of part of the administration as John was at, at a very key role in an earlier time, of course. Uh, so uh, I, I'm not blind to the matter. We'd like to see all the resources we can get here. Any conscious citizen of this country now knows we could make a litany of areas where we ought to spend more money. Prescription drug benefit, uh, health care, uh, AIDS, uh, you, you name it, education and all the rest. So uh, in a deficit economy, we know, I think it's simply fair to say, 
that the issues are going to be about can we maintain what we're doing and or get a little bit more and the downside risk will be are we going to suffer hits in the other direction. Uh, I, I'm not at liberty to talk about the next budget yet. I'm, I'm moderately optimistic uh, about that, but that's, a, but that's the length of all I should say because it's not my place to say. But on, on budget issues, uh, this is definitely very serious and I, uh, this will be at the table. One note this last year, uh, uh, Mitch Daniels in his role as OMB director and Jack Marburger as science advisor co-authored a uh, advice to the cabinet officers on priorities for science and technology and climate change was one of six along with nanotechnology and, uh, and uh, some other uh, areas. So there's various evidence around and uh, uh, everybody's taking this very seriously. That by itself is a good sign. Uh, now on your more concrete uh, question of what will be different, uh, several of the agency representatives are in the room here I know so I think I can say and they can contradict if they disagree when we close the record on this and sit down to start the next budget cycle, we expect to have a more fundamental uh, re-examination of strategy on the intellectual content of the programs and their thrust than we've had before. Second, there is a movement afoot to have a major uh, earth monitoring initiative led by the U.S that is likely to be announced soon that will be in the form of, hopefully of a, and I'm to take this all as rumor, not as fact yet, but coming along as, a, as something that would be called a White House something or other, but something like a White House, uh, you can use the word summit, but nobody's endorsed that yet, but a White House meeting uh, on, uh, on climate, on global climate observations to run in the summer of this year to be a run-up toward COP9, for those who know the jargon, the, uh, the uh, Council of Parties under the Framework Convention, uh, uh, the ninth meeting of the uh, uh, Council of Parties will be next December. Uh, so there is a fairly heavy uh, uh, push in this direction. Uh, your uh, legacy person, my boss, Conrad Lautenbacher, is leading that activity right now with strong support from Sean O'Keefe in his role at NASA. Uh, so there's a lot of thinking in the administration and it's shared broadly about moving monitoring to another level and having the U.S. take even stronger uh, positions in the Argo float program, in new satellites, uh, in new protocols for climate quality data management and so forth. Uh, and on the rest of this, I take it as almost intrinsic that on the very things we're talking about to get on and study scenarios for the future that we're going to have to see at the least uh, resources put into there. There probably have to be some redeployment. I'd never say there isn't anything that's going to be cut at all, that's for sure. I don't know if we need any uh, uh, major organization change. The president made an organization change this last year and I'd like to think it's working that we're getting more real collaboration between the funding agencies. And you know we have a different character in a lot of those. As we well know, NSF like NIH, but we're talking much more NSF typically here, has its complete culture of merit-based research grant awards and NSF can really influence longer-term research by its selection of prioritization and programs that it, it sponsors, but it can't direct its grantees as to what to do uh, uh, there. By comparison, the Department of Energy can deal with the national laboratories uh, and, and assign them more direct matters uh, and, and, and uh, NOAA and, and NASA and, and others, uh, USDA can use contracts and grants to get after questions quite directly. So I haven't seen as much surfacing of the issue that we need something new. For example, politically, there's been a move in this last Congress to say uh, we need a new White House Office of Climate. And the administration's position is we don't need a new White House Office of Client. That's kind of a policy office with a few people. We have cabinet departments with a lot of people doing the work. The issue is let's make this work, not let's make something new to have people uh, just coordinate further. So I don't know if I've answered very much at all, John, but those, that's a scatter shot of, a shot of some thoughts about that. And at the, I just... Uh, reaffirm your question is right on that th there ought to be there better be some detectable change in the next year or else we haven't done anything. Uh, Jim I'd like to come back to a science question uh, as you heard at the plenary session we had on the last day last week 
uh, somebody reminded us that the Charney report from the National Academy in 1979 uh, estimated the uncertain the, the range of uh, of climate sensitivity for a doubling of CO2 to be three plus or minus 1.5 degrees centigrade, and then the IPCC in 2001 came up with its assessment, which was um, uh, three degrees uh, plus or minus a factor of, of 50 percent, which is the same range. Now, um, the question I would put to you from a scientific perspective is whether you think it's real important to reduce that uncertainty of the climate sensitivity, and if so, down to what degree? Oh, that's a much easier question than the press usually gives. So, <laughs> first of all, a great commendation to the great Jewel Charney. Uh, for his insight uh, and good luck in, in thinking that range uh, way back when. Uh, second, does the absolute temperature uh, uh, variation make a difference? Uh, uh, and, and like uh, anything in this field, the answer is yes in part. Uh, it certainly does, but you know, I think all of us, uh, certainly when we'd be asked by uh, a non-specialist friend, would say, what's the big deal about a one degree C change in temperature? Am I going to feel that averaged over a year? The real issue is, what is this doing to Earth systems in other ways that we try to tease out of this? Are we going to see abrupt climate change? Are we going to see uh, uh, differences in, in, in uh, glaciation or lack of glaciation? Uh, are we going to see more severe storms? Uh, what do we mean by all of this? So I think that there's a, the real issue is an end-to-end -end analysis issue, that where we're, we're looking at greenhouse gases in, and we haven't even talked here about the matter that, well, CO2 is certainly among the anthropogenic-driven ones the most important, but we look at the great aerosol loadings that are occurring with, uh, with low-temperature combustion uh, times hundreds of millions of replications in, in parts of the world, uh, there's much for us to deal with when we talk end to end on the front end as to what may be driving climate change anyway. And on the back end, uh, if, if the system weren't a dynamic system, I'd probably be close to subscribing to saying who cares about narrowing the range anymore. But I don't think we should really be there at all. First of all, it would be misinterpreted if we really tried to say that. And I think the real issue is what are the other consequences, not just the temperature change. So I think we have to keep working at it. And among other things, you know, take the extreme part of that. And, and uh, uh, now the range may be narrowed some, but don't forget, and we had a lot of this healthy debate last week. We've got a lot of debate about relevance of these models still altogether. But if we said uh, with a plausible level of CO2 increase over the next century or out to the year 2100, we might see a, say, for sake of argument, one degree C average temperature change in the world. And somebody else would say we're going to see a five degree change in the world. Boy, I'd say there's a big difference in people's political willingness to do something about that because we'd be down to arguing secondary effects uh, between the two. So, uh, like anything in science, the fact that there's this degree of difference is, among other things, a reminder uh, that we need to keep working on why the difference. And there's almost a philosophy of science question in the matter that we start with the Navier-Stokes equations uh, and drive them by a series of boundary conditions, forget initial conditions, but boundary conditions anyway. Uh, hopefully we've suppressed the numerical errors. But then uh, we assume that we can adopt field-derived uh, eddy diffusion uh, parameters and apply them to basically molecular processes and believe the results. Uh, and the answer is we probably can to some fair amount, but it leaves a lot to question. And I think that's what the broad modeling community is uh, still still dealing with a lot. Uh, one ray of hope in this, the more we link uh, the continuous scales of climate analysis, including right after the extensive weather forecasting, start out two weeks and take uh, fortnight to seasonal to uh, interannual.